there. So today I'd like to go over the material that's going to be on test two. Um, first though, let me tell you that um, I'm not going to give the SI prefixes anymore, so from here on out you're expected to know them. At least the most common ones, I might give you weird ones like Yada and Zeta that you don't see a lot. But I won't give them to you anymore between um, Giga and Femto. And you're also supposed to uh, know what an angstrom is, which is 10 to minus 10 meters. So make sure that you know that. Now, um, first, we will cover chapters 3 and 4 on test 2, and so here we go with chapter 3. First of all, we introduced the concept of wave-particle duality. So, up until the late 1800s and early 1900s, the scientific community agreed that light behaved as a wave. And, of course, waves can refract and diffract, and waves diffract because they can do something that particles can't, and that's that two waves can be in the same place at the same time and then interfere with one another when that happens. And of course you have the two um, opposite examples of constructive interference where the waves are in phase, peak to peak and trough to trough, and then they add together, creating a larger amplitude wave. Or you have completely destructive interference where the peak meets up with the trough and the waves are out of phase, and when that happens, the waves sump to zero. So those are the two extreme examples, but of course you could have anything in between as well. Now, if you have um, light diffracting um, through a material, and of course um, it will uh, create a really interesting diffraction pattern. So for example, um, if you send light through a very narrow slit, then you're gonna get a diffraction pattern. Such patterns have broad central maxima, flanked by um, maxima and minima, which are bright and dark places, okay? The central maxima will be the brightest, and then all the maxima um, that move outward from there will be dimmer. Now, the derivation for this, I'm not gonna go over here. We have an online lecture on that, but just to remind you, this is due to geometrical effects. So if you understand your geometry and you know it really well, then you're good to go there. So if you have a diffraction grating, then constructive interference can be described by the equation d sine theta is equal to m lambda. And here d is the spacing of the grating, m is the order, so that's um, what uh, maximum it is. Is it the one right next to the bright band in case it's the first order? Second order is the second over from the center and so on and so forth. Lambda is the wavelength and theta is the angle to which the light is bent. So this is the same formula for double slit diffraction, except in double slit diffraction, D there is the distance between the two slits. We can also get um, diffraction of x-rays, except with x-rays, since um, in D sine theta is equal to M lambda, you see that the spacing and the grating has to be on the same order of magnitude as the wavelength, about the same size as the wavelength. If you want to diffract an x-ray, then you have to have a spacing, something spaced, in a comparable size to an x-ray wavelength. And the only thing that can really do that is a crystalline material, and the distance in between the atomic planes in a crystalline material is about the same size as an x-ray. So x-rays are diffracted by crystals. The equation for constructive interference for x-ray diffraction is 2d sine theta is equal to m lambda. The factor of 2 comes from the fact that it's going through two um, pass there, you have your incident beam and your reflective beam, and that's where the two comes from, okay? This equation is known as Bragg's Law. Um, these days, x-ray diffraction is mostly used to calculate the spacing between atomic planes and then identify materials based upon their crystalline structures. Now, x-rays were first um, discovered by Rentgen, who um, was doing experiments with cathode rays and noticed that um, some photographic plates outside of his cathode ray tube got exposed. Um, and so he hypothesized that there were these unknown um, rays that were exposing it, and he called them x-rays, x for unknown. Now, there's a kind of radiation you can create x-rays through what's known as breaking radi radiation or Bremsstrahlung radiation. In that case, what you do is you have a charged particle and you accelerate it towards a target material. And um, the energy that the charged particle loses inside of the material as it breaks or comes to a stop, okay, or slows, um, is then converted into a photon, okay? And so it's just a simple conservation of energy equation in that the amount of energy that the charged particle loses delta E is going to equal to HF 
for the photon, where h is Planck's constant and f is the frequency. This gives rise to the Duane Hunt limit if, in a single collision, the charged particle loses all of its energy, um, then that's the Duane Hunt limit, and it's the highest possible frequency or lowest possible wavelength that it will have. Now, Bremsstrahlung radiation is a continuous radiation spectrum, and it's going to start, in, if you plot at the wavelength, at the Duane Hunt limit, and then kind of have an upward hump and then decay off from there. So that's a characteristic curve that you might see for Bremsstrahlung radiation. And so, if you have your charged particle, for example, if your charged particle is an electron, then you set the charge of the electron, E, times the voltage through, what you, through which you accelerated that electron to give its um, kinetic energy, E times V naught. And then you set that equal to HF for your photon. And that will give you the maximum frequency, or HC over lambda, the minimum possible wavelength. That's your Duane Hunt limit. Speaking of which, it's very important to understand the definition of an electron volt. An electron volt is the energy that an electron has when you accelerate it through a potential of one volt, um, and it gets that from rest, okay? And so since the potential energy change is the charge times the voltage, then you have 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, which is the charge of an electron times one volt, gives you 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, and that is equal to one electron volt. So we now know that light also has particle properties. A single particle of light is called a photon. And a photon of light has an energy E is equal to HF, where F is the frequency and H is Planck's constant. This can also be set equal to HC over lambda to give you a big equation in terms of the wavelength. Now, a photon of light also has momentum. If we go back to um, the studies that we did in our chapters on special relativity, if you solve for a particle of zero mass, then you can find that um, momentum for a photon would be E over C, where E is the energy of the photon and C is the speed of light. And so you can plug in for that so that the momentum is HF over C. Um, P is equal to E over C is only going to work for massless particles, so don't try it if the particle's not massless, okay? Um, if you do, then what you're doing is you're doing the extreme speed or extreme relativistic approximation, so that won't work a lot of the time. Um, if you're using a particle that has mass, then use the definition P is equal to mv if it's going at non-relativistic speeds, or P is equal to gamma mv if it's going at relativistic speeds. So we covered the photoelectric effect. Remember that the photoelectric effect is when you have light, usually blue light or ultraviolet light, a little bit higher energy, um, incident upon a metal surface. And then what would happen is when that, um, when that light was incident on the surface, the metal would begin to emit electrons, and these were called photoelectrons. Um, the photoelectrons had a dependence um, in terms of the frequency of light with their kinetic energy. So the higher the frequency of light incident on the metal, the um, higher the kinetic energy of those photoelectrons. And this is because of Einstein's equation. Um, K max is equal to HF minus phi, where K is the kinetic energy of the photoelectrons, HF is the energy of the photon, and phi is the work function of the metal. The work function is the amount of energy that it takes to free the electron from the metal. Now we can also see that um, there's a cutoff frequency. If the light doesn't have enough energy, then it's not going to release a photoelectron at all, okay? And that's because you can't, um, you, you first need to overcome that work function. And so if you set HF equal to the work function of the material, then you can solve for what that cutoff frequency is, or you can rearrange that equation and solve for the cutoff wavelength, where the cutoff wavelength is equal to HC over phi, H Planck's constant, C speed of light, phi is the work function. It's also important to understand in the photoelectric effect that the intensity of light does not affect the kinetic energy of those photoelectrons. What more intense light means instead is that you've got more photons of light. So in terms of light intensity, more photons equals more intensity um, on a per unit time basis, of course. And if you have more photons, then you'll create more photoelectrons. So what that means is if you have a higher intensity of light, then you have a larger photoelectric current, all right? Now, um, if you change the frequency of the light, higher frequency light or shorter wavelength means more energetic electrons in terms of the kinetic energy.
The next top topic we covered was black body radiation. Remember that a black body radiator is an object um, that's sitting at any temperature and is radiating energy away based upon its temperature. Okay? And the characteristics of the black body um, spectrum that get emitted from the material depend upon the temperature of the object and its surface properties. Um, and if in this case you're going to have a continuous distribution of wavelengths from all portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now before Planck did his famous work um, on this uh, black body radiators, it was known um, that there were a couple of points about black body radiators that they could be quantified. The first was Stefan's law, which says that the power emitted, the total power of the emitter, emitted radiation from a black body radiator is equal to sigma times A times E times T to the fourth minus T naught to the fourth. Now in each one of those things, sigma is a constant. The constant is 5.67 times 10 minus 8 watts per meter squared Kelvin to the fourth. A is the surface area of the object. E is the emissivity, which is a number that ranges between 0 and 1. It's 0 if it's a perfect reflector, I think of spherical mirrors, and it's 1 if it's a perfect black body. T to the fourth is the temperature of the object to the fourth power, and T naught to the fourth is the temperature of the, black, uh, of the background radiation to the fourth power. Okay. Now, Wien's law was also known. And Wien's law says that the peak of the wavelength distribution um, in the spectrum, the black body spectrum, the peak of that spectrum is going to shift to shorter wavelengths as the temperature increases. And that was known as Wien's displacement law. And that one says that lambda max, which is the, the wavelength at the maximum of the intensity curve, lambda max times the temperature, T, is equal to 2.898 times 10 to the minus 3 meters times Kelvin. So that was Wien's displacement law. Now, in order to understand and explain what was going on with black body radiators, Max Planck explained it like this. He said that you have a solid, and in that solid you could model it as a bunch of little balls where the atoms are supposed to be, connected together by bonds which could be modeled as little springs or harmonic oscillators. And what he said was that those springs only vibrate at certain frequencies, certain quantized values of the frequency, and that the energy um, of those springs was equal to n times h times f, where f is the frequency of oscillation, h is a constant that became known as Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules seconds, and n was some integer. Okay, so they could only heard, hold certain integer values. Now, if you wanted to have a, um, a radiation emitted or absorbed by this, what happened was the springs would oscillate and jump from one quantized energy level to another, and to do that, they would then absorb or emit, of a, emit a photon of thermal energy, or emit a photon of light, which explained why the black body curve looked the way that it did. And it turns out, of course, that Planck was very, very, very close to right. In fact, if you look at the equation for the quantum harmonic oscillator that we solved later, then he was only off by a factor of a half. Um, a quantum harmonic oscillator has energy levels of n plus one half times hf. So he was very, very close in his explanation, which is really good considering that he did all this work in the late 1800s before quantum mechanics was even developed. The next concept we covered was the idea of the Compton effect. The Compton effect is when you have an X-ray incident on a material that collides elastically with an electron. And when that happens, it imparts its kinetic energy to it, some of its kinetic energy. Since the photon itself is going to lose some of its kinetic energy, that's going to shift the wavelength of the photon. And the equation that describes that shift is the Compton shift equation, which says that delta lambda, that shift in the wavelength, is equal to h over mec times 1 minus cosine of theta. Okay, so delta lambda is the shift in the wavelength, h, h is Planck's constant, me is the mass of the electron, c is the speed of light, and theta is the angle that the photon is scattered at. Okay? Now, it's important to understand that ultraviolet or visible light photons don't interact with matter in this way because the shift in wavelength isn't very significant for those want longer wavelength photons. So the Compton effect was more proof that light can act like a particle because it can elastically um, scatter off things, okay? Energy and momentum conservation modeling photons as particles was used to solve for the final conditions of the scattered electron and of the photon. Pair production is another way that light can interact with matter. 
Um, for this, you need gamma rays, basically. Gamma ray photons have enough energy to create particle and antiparticle pairs. In fact, this is the dominant way that gamma rays interact with matter. And so what you can do is you can solve for the amount of energy that it would take to create a matter-antimatter pair. Now remember that antimatter has the same mass but the opposite charge as the corresponding matter. So a positron, which is the antiparticle of the electron, has the same mass as an electron, but it has a charge plus E instead of minus E. So if you're going to create this mass out of nowhere, we're going to use Einstein's famous equation mc squared. And since it's creating a particle-antiparticle pair that have the same mass, then in order to have this happen, your photon has to have a minimum energy, hf min, which is equal to 2 mc squared. Now, if you have any extra energy above and beyond that hf, then it can go into creating some kinetic energy for the particles that you've just made. Okay. The reverse of pair production can also occur. Under the proper conditions, an electron and a positron can annihilate one another and produce two gamma ray photons. Under these conditions, momentum and energy must also be conserved. It's also important to understand that in terms of these um, high energy collisions, they often write them in terms of notation but, uh, in a similar way to the way that you would write a chemical reaction. So you have your two um, reactants here, the electron and the positron that yield two gamma ray photons. So this is the kind of notation that you can expect to see in high energy physics. Okay, that's it for chapter three. That hits the high points. Um, now let's move on to chapter four. So in addition to um, particle properties of light, there's also wave properties of particles. So wave particle duality, it goes both ways. Now, Louis de Broglie postulated that because photons have both wave and particle characteristics, perhaps all forms of matter had both properties. And so he said that the wavelength of a matter wave would be h over p, where h is Planck's constant and p is the momentum of that particle. A few years later, not very long at all, Davison and Germer went on to do some experiments with nickel and showed that this was, in fact, true. Basically, their idea was that since light is diffracted, if particles exhibit wave properties, then particles could also be diffracted from crystals. And they tested this out and found it to be true um, for electrons incident on a nickel surface. And you can see that the equation is very, very similar to the equation that you see for x-ray diffraction. Here, d sine phi is equal to n lambda, where um, lambda is the wavelength of the uh, electrons, n is the order. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> D is the crystal in spacing, and phi is the angle that the um, electrons were diffracted to from the incident. Sorry about my sneeze. Pause it there. I bet it looks really crazy. Okay, now let's talk about ideal waves versus real waves, and this helps us understand the concept of wave packets. Now, real waves are always um, localized in space although we think of ideal waves as being sort of infinite in extent. You think of a sine or a cosine function that just goes on forever. Real waves are always localized in a packet. Now you get wave packets by summing up a lot of ideal waves. And when you do this, it's called Fourier series, um, then you can produce a wave packet. It's important to remember some of the notation that we use um, in waves. So for example, we're gonna use the function psi uh, to describe our, uh, our quantum waves. So psi, which is a function of position and time, would then be equal to some amplitude of oscillation A times sine kx minus omega t plus phi. Here, phi would be the phase shift. K is the wave number, which is 2 pi over lambda. And omega is the angular frequency, which is 2 pi over the period, or 2 pi f. Let's talk about the uncertainty principle. Now, in classical mechanics, it's possible in principle to make measurements with arbitrarily small uncertainty. But quantum theory predicts that it's fundamentally impossible to make simultaneous measurements of a particle's position and momentum with infinite accuracy. That also goes, by the way, for the energy and the time. So it's physically impossible to do this. It doesn't come from imperfections in your measuring device, okay? It's not because you can't just measure it because your device isn't precise enough it's because it's fundamentally impossible to do so. However, these uncertainties are very, very small as dictated by the uncertainty principle. Now these uncertainties arise from the quantum structure of matter and its wave nature. Now you can see that if you look at what the wave number is for a matter wave, that's two pi over lambda, if you 
plug in De Broglie's equation lambda is equal to h over p, then you get k is equal to p over h. Now, if you had a Gaussian wave packet, then that gives you the smallest possible uncertainty, okay? And for a Gaussian wave packet, the uncertainty that you would have is h bar over 2. But since that's the smallest possible uncertainty, that puts a threshold, and all other uncertainties will be greater than or equal to that. And that's why we express our um, position momentum uncertainty principle as delta px times delta x is greater than or equal to h bar over 2. There's another form of the uncertainty principle, the energy time one, and that's delta E delta T is greater than or equal to h bar over 2. Again, the one-half factor comes from Gaussian wave packets. Every other type of wave packet will have an uncertainty larger than that. Now, this energy time uncertainty principle actually suggests that energy conservation can be violated by a small amount as long as you don't do it for very long, which is something that comes into play when we start talking about quantum tunneling. Now, if you go back to packets and think about how um, if you have a bunch of waves in the same place, then they obey the superposition principle, which means they add together, then this is kind of how you sum up and make a wave packet that's localized in space. So if you do that, then um, let's look at what happens if you just sum two waves together. And if you sum two waves together, then what you'll get is um, sort of an envelope, which is indicated here by this dashed line, okay? And then you'll have the uh, packet itself oscillating within that envelope. So the envelope sort of controls what the amplitude of oscillation of your packet is. Now, the envelope itself is um, described here as cosine of delta k x over 2 minus delta omega over 2 times t. Okay, so that gives you a difference in wave number between the 2 divided by 2. And then the, uh, the oscillation inside the packet is described as cosine k average x minus omega average t, okay? And so what we're talking about here is basically a phase velocity versus a group velocity. Because if you define um, your velocity as omega over k, then you can see that you have two different velocities here, okay? So you'll have the velocity of your envelope, which will be defined as delta omega over delta k, and you'll have your velocity of the stuff moving inside the envelope, which is omega average over k average. This is known as dispersion, okay? So the phase velocity, like I said, v phase is omega over k, and the group velocity is delta omega over delta k. Okay? If um, you have more than just two waves, if you've got a bunch of waves in your packet, then that goes to a d omega dk. And so your v group is d omega dk, and you can rewrite that as d e d p. You can also rewrite your phase velocity as e over p. Now, in classical physics, in a dispersive material like glass, the index of refraction varies with the wavelength and different colors of light travel at different speeds. And this is what causes rainbows, okay? So if you want to think of dispersion in a classical way, then that's it. Okay, so um, that covers most of what we covered in chapter three and four, at least I hit the high points. Um, study hard, study all your homework questions, study the examples in the book, study the questions in the book that we didn't cover or assign for homework, and you should be good to go. All right, let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you in class.